Let's all stand and worship together this morning. You glad to be in God's house? Say amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Come, come to the water. All who are thirsty, come and be filled. Come, come to the river, brothers and sisters, come and be healed. I'll sing that again. Come, come to the water, all who are thirsty, come and be filled. Oh, yeah. Come, come to the river. Brothers and sisters, come and be healed. Come and be healed. We believe in the kingdom come. We believe in the risen sun. You bring our hearts to life. Lord, we come with our hands up high. We believe you will satisfy. You bring our Savior, light of the world. He's the light of the world. We believe in the kingdom calling. We believe in the risen sun. You bring our hearts to life. Lord, we come with our hands up high. We believe you will satisfy you. Lift it up. Lord, 
Let revival come, let the people sing the glory of your name. One more time, sing church. Let revival come, let the people sing the glory of your name, the glory of your name. I'll give him glory this morning. Yes, Lord. I don't know about you, but I want revival. And guess what? It starts with us. Let's sing this. This world can be cold and bitter. Feels like we're in the dead of winter, waiting on something better. But am I really going to hide forever, over and over again? I hear your voice in my head. Let your light shine, let your light shine for all to see and start a fire in my soul. Fan the flame and make it grow. So there's no doubt or denying. Let it burn so brightly that everyone around can see that it's you, that it's you. You only need a spark to start a whole blaze. It only takes a little faith. Let it start right here in this city. So these old walls will never be the same. Over and over again, I hear your voice in my head. They need to know, I need to go. Spirit, won't you fall on my heart now? Start a fire in my soul. Fan the flame and make it grow. So they start a fire in me dear lord you know i've had the the verse on my mind a lot lately you hath he quickened who are dead in your trespasses and sins and i'm grateful that god can take something dead and make it alive again and those two songs if you didn't catch on we're talking about revival right now when i was a kid revival was a big thing we did multiple revivals throughout the year and it was a big thing and I think that all across the world today, revival needs to become something of a priority because I feel that there are so many churches full of dead Christians, folks that have just gotten comfortable and got complacent and stopped doing what they're supposed to be doing. Each one of us should pray for revival. See, Pastor and I, we can pray for revival for the church. But until we are all revived as individuals, we can never be revived as a church. Amen? Revival starts with you and me. So let's take an inward look today. Am I living for Christ? Am I producing fruit? Jesus said that's the proof as to whether or not you're alive in Christ. Are you producing fruit? If you're not, then you could very well be a dead Christian. Let's take an inward look today and ask ourselves, am I producing fruit? And if not, may it start with me revival anybody want revival say amen. amen is anybody glad to be in god's house this morning give him some praise amen 
It's good to see you all here today. We got a new memory verse for the month of April. Actually, two verses this month. Goes great with April being Resurrection Month. We celebrate Easter in a couple of weeks. Matthew 28, verse 5 and 6. Let's say these verses together. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, who was crucified. I love this. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And all God's people said, amen. We got a big service in plan uh, for Easter Sunday. Got some great music in store. I cannot wait to celebrate Resurrection Sunday with you in a couple of weeks. Uh, but hey, let's go ahead and start now. Let's celebrate the resurrection. Celebrate the life that we have in Christ. He's here right now. You're here. That's a recipe for success. I'm honored to be worshiping with you here today. And if you're honored to be worshiping with those around you today, find someone that you hadn't said good morning to, fist bump, handshake, high five, tell them you're glad to see them in God's house. Continue in worship this morning. We live for you. Mm -hmm. We live for you. Oh, 
Sing it to him. Rain down heavenly flame here in this place. Unleash your power. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Yes, Lord. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. That's our invitation to you, Jesus, today, that you have your way. That we would not stand in the way of what you want to do here today. That we would come to you fully surrendered with a holy expectation of what you're going to do here. And I know you're already doing something great. But my Bible tells me that there's so much more that you can do 
than I could ever ask or think. And what you have in store is so much greater than I could ever imagine. I believe that we are on the verge of revival. I believe that. As bad as things are in the world, and as near as I believe that the return of Christ is, I don't think we're too far gone. Because the Bible tells me that there's nothing impossible for God. So I'm not giving up. I come to you today, Jesus, fully surrendered, asking you to start in me. Light a fire in me. Start revival in me. God, revive our church. Revive our city. Revive our state, our country. Revive the world. We know you can, we know you will. So God, we come today fully surrendered, allowing you to do what you want. Do what you want to with us, Jesus. Thank you for the privilege to be here to worship you today. Thank you for the privilege to sing songs of praise to you. May we never take for granted what a gift that is. God, we pray your power on our pastor today. Lord, give him strength physically as he stands before us and preaches the word that you've laid on his heart. God, I pray that we would be open, receptive, and excited to hear the word of God today. And we would allow you to work in our hearts. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray all these things today. Amen. You may be seated. I hear you singing it. Sing that chorus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Hill. Take your Bibles this morning in the New Testament. We're going to begin in Luke chapter 14. We're going to be in several places. I would ask that you pray for me. I, was, I had a severe allergic reaction. was in the hospital last night, so I'm here this morning, but very weak. And so, uh, but I'm not going to let the devil get the victory. Amen. Uh, you know, he's, he's attacking a lot of folks in this time, and folks, it's only going to get 
a more and more frequent to see that what the devil's trying to do, divide the sheep and the flock, scatter them, so he might destroy them. We think about last, the last week of the Lord Jesus' life and ministry, and it began on Palm Sunday, and you know everything that went on that day. And Jesus entering the temple, they went out of Jerusalem and he stayed at Bethany, and the Bible tells us that on Monday... He cursed a fig tree because it didn't bear any fruit out of season. But Jesus was showing the Israelites that they're to always be bearing fruit. And that message to them is the message to you and I. There's never a season that we should not be bearing spiritual fruit. That's what faith rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ does. It bears spiritual fruit in our lives. And so back at the temple, he went and examined the Pharisees, and you remember that. He was, from the time he was 12 years old, or maybe younger, we don't know, but from that time all the way until he ascended into heaven, he was challenging the religious elite of the day. The hypocrites, the Pharisees, the generation of vipers, those that were of their father, the devil, he said. That's interesting that he said that Jesus, Almighty God, looked at religious people and said, you are of your father, the devil. In other words, you are his offspring. What he does, you do. Now that's an interesting thing to think about, perhaps for a different time. But he went into the temple and he exposed their worship as being wrong. And you remember what the Lord Jesus did on not just one, but... Many scholars and professors that I had in seminary believe as many as three different times Jesus cleansed the temple. What they were doing there was not God honoring. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. And he, with a whip and overturning tables, you might see in a moment of weakness a Christian Uh, get frustrated to the point that perhaps they don't act in a way that you think they should act. I'm sure there were Christians saying the same thing about Jesus when he went into God's house and there there were people taking advantage of God's people and they were selling and buying goods in God's house. And he overthrew the table with all the money and the money changers and he took a whip and did what Will Smith did to Chris Rock at the Grammys, or whatever, the Oscars. He slapped him in the next week, you know. And I'm not going to get into all that, but, you know, in a, in a, in a sense, uh, you know, I can see both sides of it. But in this case, the Lord Jesus was mad. Righteous indignation. And he cleansed the temple. And, and, and he goes out, and so back at the temple, he examined the Pharisees on Monday. He cleanses the temple And then in doing so, he exposes their worship that they were doing as wrong and the fact that they had missed the true Messiah. That's what they wanted. That's what they were longing for. And there he was. But he didn't look or act or do things that they thought their Messiah would do. But little do do they know if they would have just read their Bible if they knew their Bible, and at that point it was the Old Testament Scriptures in Hebrew, if they knew their Bible, they would know that Jesus would not come the first time as a king that would conquer and kill. But rather He would come as a meek and lowly servant. He would be looked upon and people would turn their eyes away from Him. Whatever it was, I don't know. I can tell you I was pretty scary looking yesterday with my face swelled up and my throat swelled up and my eyes closed up. I mean, it was bad. And I don't know what exactly it was about Jesus, but the Bible says He has no form nor comeliness that men should desire Him. In other words, we don't want to get near to that guy. And that was the case with the Jews. And so they rejected Messiah. And Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and now Thursday, He borrows an upper room and and he washes the disciples' feet. And we're not going to get into all these stories. I'm, I'm just laying the background for some things that are coming in, the, in, the, in the, a few weeks. But then he sits at the table with the disciples. Of course, that is depicted as the Lord's Supper by Da Vinci. 
which is probably inaccurate. Why would you sit at a table with all the chairs on one side facing a wall or a room? I don't know. Maybe that's the way they did it. But in my, in my estimation, it would be people on both sides. And when Jesus said uh, that Judas shared the dip or the gravy or whatever it was, I believe he was right across from him. And I believe when he, when he handed the dip to him, he was close enough just like that to hand it to him, to hand the sop. And so he sits at the table with his disciples, and, and he, then as, as they're eating, now understand it's a little different than what we do when we observe the Lord's Supper, and we'll be doing that here uh, around Easter time. But we come in and, and we observe the bread representative, not transubstantiation where it actually becomes the body of Christ, that's gross, that's cannibalism. We don't believe that. The Catholics teach it, we don't believe that. It's representative, just like baptism is representative of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and the death, burial, and the resurrection of the old man, and a new man or woman raised to walk in newness of life. So the wafer is a picture of the bread or the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, as is the wine and uh, the juice. And it is a, not real blood, but it is a picture. It's emblematical of what Jesus shed at Calvary for us. And so in the midst of this supper, which by the way, the Passover supper, it didn't involve just bread and wine. There were other things there as well. But the bread and wine served the Lord Jesus' purpose. Because at one time He said, I am the bread of life. At one time he, he talked about shedding his own blood. And that's what he was showing the disciples here. And then in an unsuspecting turn of events, the Lord Jesus at the supper table, now imagine this, put yourself in this position. And I apologize now, I'm going to have to drink a lot of water. The medicine they gave me is drying me out pretty good, so just ignore that. But imagine the table. And in the midst of all these things that have happened from the washing of the feet to the sitting down at the table to the showing the disciples the bread and the wine and what it represented, Jesus in the midst of whatever conversation was going on while he sat there with them and perhaps they were questioning their, their own hearts and things like that, I don't know because it is certainly a time of reflection when we observe the Lord's Supper. And it's very, very serious for any Christian. And that's why it's reserved for Christians. And the Bible talks very seriously and very plainly about partaking of that in an unworthy manner. And how that some are sick. And some are not feeling good. And some are dead because they partook of the Lord's Supper unworthily. And so in this unsuspecting turn of events, the Lord Jesus looks at His disciples and He says, one of them is going to betray him. Now think about that. We're all friends gathered around the table and he says, one of you is going to betray me. Quite frankly, I think he's looking directly in the eyes of Judas when he says it. And the disciples, as we learned last week, they didn't, they didn't know that it was Judas. They didn't know who it was. They began to search their own hearts and they said, is it I, Lord? Is it I? And Jesus tells them that it is the one that he's going to give the sop to. He identifies the man. He identifies the betrayer. He identifies the goat or the wolf among the sheep. And that's exactly what he does right here. And he gives the sop, and while they're questioning in their own heart and loyalty to the Lord Jesus, he gives it to Judas. And it's like uh, uh, when, when uh, the prophet told David after Bathsheba and and he tells him a story about a little sheep that, that somebody came and, and stole that sheep and they had guests and, and that pet sheep that everybody loved. It was treated like a, perhaps like a, we would treat a dog or a cat today. Well, a dog, not a cat. We don't treat cats good. But anyway, a dog. We love them. And, and it was a pet lamb. And they took it and they killed it and they, they roasted it and they fed it to their guests. And, and the prophet uh, told David, or asked David, what, Oh, king, what, what should happen when, when somebody does that? And man, he went crazy. And he said, you need to do this, and they ought to do that, and all these things, and we won't get into this morning. And, and Nathan turns 
to David and says, Thou art the man. And Bathsheba was that little lamb that belonged to her husband. And you took her. The Bible tells us that when Jesus identified Judas, he ran out and Satan entered him. And folks, I've got to be honest with you, I've studied this over and over from north, south, east, and west, and from a thousand mile up position looking down on it. And I don't understand all that went on that allowed Judas, one of the twelve, to be possessed by the devil, but he was. And it wasn't all the time, it was for this time. And we know that it was appointed what would happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. And like I said, if Judas hadn't done it, somebody else would have done it because it was prophesied. But there he is. He ran out and very soon from the upper room they went to Gethsemane to pray and there are 11 now and three are with Jesus in the inner circle and they're going to pray deeper into the garden. And it is there that the betrayer of the Lord Jesus, Judas, he shows up with the soldiers. And you of course now know the rest of the story and what happens. And the events of the garden are now complete and John tells us of the arresting party that bound the Lord Jesus and led him away. And, and, and the, other, the other apostles talk about it in their Gospels. And while the Lord Jesus Christ is on the inside being tried, understand Peter, of all the people, is on the outside on trial for his life of his faith. And follow with me here as I say that. In order to understand what's happened, we need to understand the fact that the Lord Jesus predicted everything that he and his disciples were going to face. And Peter, specifically, is the one I want to focus on this morning. And so, with your Bibles, look in Luke 14, and let's read a few verses. And it says in verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and 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 like I gave you Isaiah 53 as the backdrop of that couple of weeks of messages, I want to use Luke 14 this morning as the backdrop of this message. Because as I said, we're going to be in some different passages. But in verse 25 he says, And there went great multitudes with Jesus, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, He cannot be my disciple. Underline that in your Bible. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Understand this morning, folks, that the one that issues the call sets the terms. We're not allowed to negotiate the means by which we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me this morning? And we go on in verse 27, And whoso doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? lest happily after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it will mock him, saying, This man began to build, but he didn't finish it. And you know the parable that Jesus gave right there. And the parable is, and and I know certainly those of you that are carpenters, Brother Willie right here will certainly understand this. How foolish would it be to own a piece of property or buy one, intend to build a house, lay the foundation, perhaps you've got some of the framing up, and even the front you can see the facade of where the door's going to go, but you never thought about how much money it was going to cost. You thought, I'll just go to Lowe's and and grab some two-by-fours and perhaps a door, and, and I got these friends that do concrete, and we got the concrete... How foolish is it that it would stand there incomplete? 
what it is, it's a testimony to someone that wouldn't count the cost. And so it is today. To everyone that says, I want to I be a Christian. I want to come to Christ. But you don't count the cost. Why am I here this morning? After taking, I don't even know how many Benadryl and getting steroid shots and all that to help all of this. I could be laying in bed right now and quite frankly this morning I thought I might have to. But a long time ago I counted the cost. And I saw from a godly man, my mentor, my father in the ministry. I've seen him preach when he had barely had a voice. I've seen him preach when he was almost dying. And so here I am. And, and glory to God, not me. The point I'm making is I know what God called me to do and I'm to be here and do it. As we saw last week, Judas, because he was lost, because he lived and died in his sin, because he rejected all the teaching and preaching of the gospel. so that he could be saved from his sin. Judas was not able to finish what he started. He died alone on a hillside in, in Judea, and he went to hell for all eternity. And folks, he's as alive today as he's ever been alive, only dying but ever, never able to die in a place called hell. Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ and his holy cause for 30 pieces of silver. And just like Luke 14, Mark 14 finds the Lord Jesus sharing the very simple, similar passage to people that follow him. And I want you to go to Mark 14. And only this time he broadens the reference. And it's not only the apostles. It's not only the professing Christ followers. It's not only those on his inner circle, his best friends. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 27, And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me tonight. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. You know what Jesus said right there? All of you are going to betray me tonight because of fear. For Judas, it was perhaps something different. Hate, jealousy, pride, money. We saw Judas. We remember several weeks ago, Judas in Mark 14. But the chapter goes like this. The Mary, the anointing of the Lord Jesus. Judas, the betraying of the Lord Jesus. And today we come to Peter, the denying of the Lord Jesus. And there's also the apostles forsaking the Lord Jesus. And we'll see how that goes over the coming weeks. But, but now get this. What we see Peter doing here is a very powerful revelation to his disciples. And it's recorded in verse 29. Notice it. And Peter said unto him, Jesus, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. You know what he was doing? He was showing his pride. He was showing what he thought of himself. He said, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, Jesus, and we know what Judas did. Or is going to do. And all these other ones, they probably will forsake you and deny you, but not me, Lord. Not me. Maybe you've said that sometime in your life. Everybody else, I see them going by the wayside. I see them dropping out, leaving, out of church, away from the Lord. And you said, you know, that'll never be me. Pay attention to what I'm getting ready to say. 
I'm convinced that when Peter made that statement, he really meant it. I really honestly believe that. Peter loved the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, let's be honest, the dude was half crazy. Many people believe that he was uh, kind of had a Scottish look, giant red, red type person, big, big guy with a big beard, and, and he was just all over the place having, you know, always having a blast, always getting into trouble. I don't know, maybe he was maybe he kind of looked like Colin, my son. I don't know. He's you know got a reddish beard. I don't know. I'm convinced also that Peter had every intention of doing what he said he was going to do in that moment. When he said, everyone's going to deny you, but Lord, you can count on me. I believe that he truly believed that. The problem was that Peter greatly misjudged himself. He greatly misjudged what he was capable of. We can all be guilty of that as well, can't we? Whether in our hearts or in our circle of friends or in our church group, we make bold statements. I've learned to be quite weary of folks that do that in the church. I call them one-month wonders. They come in, and I do this, and I do that, and, and can I sing, and can I preach? And, 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 I, and, you know, just like I told Brother Hill, and I've told anybody that's ever come through here that stands on this platform, you get faithful and prove yourself. It's required that a man be found faithful. You do that. I don't care about your talent. If you love the Lord and you want to do something, that's fine, but you've got to prove yourself faithful. Nobody stands behind this pulpit that's not been completely vetted and has a proven pattern of faithfulness serving God in their life. I think we've all been guilty, though, of making these bold statements. And I want you to think about the reality of what it means to be a disciple of Christ because he says this in verse 29, All shall be offended, yet not I. I got to be honest with you folks, I worry about the times that we are heading in. And, and you go, now preacher, you know the Bible, and, and I do. I know, I listen, I know where we're going. I know whom I believed in, and I'm persuaded, just like Paul, that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, the day of judgment. I believe that with all my heart. But I also believe there's some things going on in our world, and, and, and folks, it's not going to get better. I'm telling you this because I love you and you need to be prepared. It's not going to get better before Jesus returns. This place is going to continue to wind down and spin out of control until the Lord Jesus takes you and I and the believers home and then all hell is going to break loose and then the Antichrist will stand up and say, listen, this is the problem, we've got it. There's a lot of supposition as to what's going on. And, but I can, you know, we've talked about this for years, but isn't it strange now? And I'm not some conspiracy theorist, or, and I don't follow aliens, and I don't go to Area 51 with binoculars trying to find out stuff. But isn't it weird that now, of all time, the government is now admitting that there's UFOs? The government's admitted it in declassified documents. It's not UFOs. It's not... It's not other people just like us from some other distant planet making contact. Folks, it's fallen demons. And there's, whether they manifest themselves in darkness or in light, they're all of the devil. The devil himself is transformed into an angel of light. What does that mean? An angel of good. So what do we do with that? Do we let our emotions run away with us and go, He is amazing. He's, he's awesome. He's got all these powers. And yes, all of those things are true about Him. He was an angel created by God. He has supernatural power only, only to be trumped by the Lord Jesus Christ and Almighty God Himself. And I look at... What is it that's going to unite the entire world for a global economy? What is it? They're trying right now everything to do it, but they can't. About the time they think they're able to bring everybody together through COVID, all of a sudden now we've got war and everybody's divided again. I honestly believe in my heart, and you can take this or leave it. This is just my opinion. It's not biblical. I have no biblical basis for it. I'm just sharing. I think at some point 
they're going to pull, they're going to pull the curtain back on all those extra terrestrial things that are going on and I think the devil himself is going to come against mankind and what will unite the planet a common enemy they wanted to do it with COVID it didn't work okay it didn't work plan B it's coming friend and, and the reason why I say all of that is I'm worried about the faith of some. They get knocked out of the church pew for any little... You get, a, you get your pinky toe hurt and, and you miss church. And you don't serve Jesus and you don't come to Bible studies and you don't come to the refresh. And listen, in your mind you can come up with what you want, but the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in the breaking of bread and in fellowship and all these things... We are a called out assembling of the saints of God. Amen? That's what the name church means. And it doesn't matter, listen friend, listen church, if it's in this auditorium, if it's in that classroom, if it's a ladies Bible study, or if we're eating uh, red beans and, and cornbread. Well, I won't eat cornbread, but everybody else eating cornbread. You have been called out as liberty. To show up. Well, I don't got money. I got things to do. You know what? Join the crowd. We're following Jesus. We're strengthening the brethren. Amen? The Bible says that we know that we're Christians. We know that we are lovers of Christ because we love the brethren which are also Christ. There's a part in here, you know, talking about Peter. I'm going to skip over, but let me just make this statement. Christians are really good about judging everybody else's faults, aren't they? Amen? <laughs> I think Jesus talked about that, didn't he? He goes, why are you worried about the little uh, sawdust speck in your brother's eye when you've got a two before sticking out of your own eye? Deal with that, and then maybe you can see a little more clearly, Right? Am I right? So before we go spouting off and listening to things and, and spreading things about other people, maybe we ought to check the weeds out in our own backyard before we start judging somebody else's front yard. Amen? You know what Peter should have done in all this? He should have worried about Peter. Instead, he was boasting Notice verse 30, Mark 14, 30. And he saith unto him, Verily I say unto you, This day, even this night, before the rooster crows two times, thou shalt deny me thrice. This is followed by more denials and declarations of loyalty. Look at verse 31. But he spake the more vehemently unto Jesus, or uh, Peter is, If I would die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. Now notice that. They're all back here. Behind Peter, the front, the front man. And they're like, yeah, Peter, let him know, let him know. So Peter opens his mouth and says, you know what? <laughs> and it's funny. Because they're all behind. These guys will probably deny you, Lord, but not me. He said, I never will. Even if I have to die for you, I never will. And what he's saying is, I've counted the cost. I know what it means to follow Christ. And everybody else goes, yeah, that goes for me too, Lord. Did you notice the last part of verse 31? Notice it. Likewise also said they all. I guess Peter is kind of the leader of the pack. Have you ever noticed how packs run? You got the one big, the guy in the front that's got a really big mouth and probably the biggest guy and nobody else has a backbone. And so most of them just either are quiet going, yeah, go get them. Or they just parrot the things that he says. Have you ever noticed that? 
after Peter's bold declaration, all the disciples repeatedly declared, Lord, I, I'm with you all the way. I will die for you. I will die with you if that's what it takes. And you know what? If they would have come, I believe, and followed Jesus to that court where people were getting out of hand and all those things, I think every one of them would have been crucified beside Jesus. But they didn't come, did they? They left Jesus all alone. There are only two disciples that followed him a little bit. One is Peter and the other one, we don't know his name, but we believe it's John. And when they reached the high priest's house, John went in because he knew the, he knew the high priest, so he was able to go in at first. And then John came back to the gate and talked to the young, young woman there that was watching the gate and, and Peter, so that Peter could get in the courtyard. And I want you to flip back over to John chapter 18 real quick. I'll show you some passages this morning. Let me begin reading. Pick up in verse 12 with me, and then we're going to go to 12 to 18 and then down to 25. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Let me explain something right here. What they thought was Jesus was going to stir and get an uproar going. And what they thought was if we kill Jesus, and even Lazarus, by the way, who had been raised from the dead, then the Roman soldiers won't come in because if there's an insurrection, they're going to come in and slaughter everybody. That's what they did. They ruled by fear. And so there is some logic to what they wanted to do right here. Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to Jews, and it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, again, John very seldom mentioned his own name, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, again, John, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel at the, that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he saith, and you're having the mark in your Bible, underline it because this is number one, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood, stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. Now notice this. The servants of the high priest and the officers, th these are the people that came and took Jesus away from the garden, okay? They warned themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And Simon and Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art thou also one of his disciples? And he, decided, he, de he denied it and said, and note this, number two, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, being a kinsman whose ear Peter cut off, saith, now that was, this is Malchus's relative, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and the other gospels give account that he used curse language to solidify his, his, his vow to them, I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crew. Now there's a couple of things about this Christian, this Christ follower, this man, who said when things get hard, Lord, you can count on me to be by your side. And I want you to seriously listen to the message this morning because Peter is a perfect example of what many so-called Christians are doing this morning, and I'll try to be quick. They say one thing when the Lord Jesus is there and the opposite thing the next day. Notice, first of all, Peter denying the Lord Jesus 
to the devil's crowd. It's interesting to note that how John repeats the fact that Peter was standing and in warming himself by the fire. He's in the crowd. He's with the ones that took Jesus. I don't know if he was cloaked. I don't, I don't know. I don't know all the little details, but he's there with them. I remember it was the time, the time before modern electricity and flashlights and all that, so I'm sure they had a few uh, torches. And it would have been very easy not to clearly see the face of, uh, of somebody that was with Jesus. I, I get it. But these people look at him and remember. And there he is standing with them. And at first glance, I guess, I, I suppose it appears innocent. I mean, I've been out in the cold, and man, I remember being in Fort Benning, 82nd Airborne, standing out there in some numb skull in basic training, said, I don't want to wear my, my coat. Of course, in the military, it's all or nothing. If you don't wear your coat, you can't wear your gloves. If you don't wear your gloves, you can't wear your coat. So all we are in is BDUs, and it's 20, 30, 20 to 30, but the wind's blowing it really, really bad. And we're out there standing at attention like this with our feet together in a, in a 45, or excuse me, a 90 degree angle like that for like three hours. And people are dropping like flies. They're locking their knees and they're... I, you know what all I was thinking about? I need something warm right now. And shame on that dummy that said we don't need a coat, right? I get it. He's warming himself by the fire. It's cold. Matthew Henry wrote this. He says, those that warm themselves with evildoers, those that warm themselves with evildoers, those that get, listen, that get comfortable with evildoers, grow cold towards good people and good things and those that are found of the devil's fireside are in danger of the devil's fire. Written in the 1800s. He's so true. It's so right. Because isn't that the way it is? Evil communication corrupts good manners. You get with the wrong people and you hear the wrong things, you talk about the wrong things, and before long you own that, before long you are that. why God throughout the word gave so many warnings. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, the evil thing, and I'll receive you. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and, and all these things, he said, they're going to pass away. But my word shall stand for all eternity. The keeper of the door was a young slave woman, by the way. The narrative in our culture today tells us that, that only black folks were ever enslaved. That's not true. The Jewish nation was the most enslaved nation in the world in the history of the world. Go back 4,000 years ago. It started Egypt all, all the way back. There's so, much, so many fairy tales out there about that. Look at the American Indians. There's, there's people in China that are enslaved right now. Human trafficking is everywhere. There, there, it wasn't one group of people because of the color of their skin that got enslaved. What happened to them was horrible, terrible, wrong, and I believe that God hated it, and I tell you, I would hate it, and I'd be against it, and I would fight against it. But they weren't the only ones. You don't let your school teacher tell you anything different, Students. The keeper of the door is a young slave woman. And she asked Peter this question in John 18, verse 17. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou also one of his, this man's disciples? And he saith, I am not. You know what Peter wanted to do here? Peter wanted to avoid the consequences of being a Christian. Do you realize that, that Christians were not named Christian as a, as a term of endearment or love? It was a term of derision. And what it means is a little Christ, a Christ follower, 
a Christ imitator. And the Bible says in the book of Acts that they were first called Christian because they were Christian. <laughs> they got called that because they acted like a Christian. But Peter was wanting to avoid the consequences of being a Christ follower. And that's what being a Christian means. A saved, born again, blood bought, blood washed, changed Christ follower. What Peter did was compromise the truth, right? Is that an idea? Every step of compromise you take, folks, from God is a step in the wrong direction. And it, it got Peter in the door, but the problem was this was going to set a pattern for Peter that would manifest itself very quickly. And it's, a, it's so easy to justify a little lie, isn't it? Let's be honest, we've all done it. We've all done it. We're all sinners. John said, if, if you say you have no sin, you are a liar and you've deceived yourself. All those folks who are at, at the Nazarene church that think you can reach sinless perfection in this world and so you'll get a Kmart blue light over your head to signify your perfection, let me tell you, that's false doctrine, that's a false church, and it's a bunch of garbage. Yes, I said it, and yes, it's being broadcast. Bring your Bibles, come to my office, we'll make an appointment, and I'll show you what the Scripture says. One little lie makes it easier to justify. Have you ever known, noticed when, when a child tells a lie? Then they got to tell another lie to protect that lie and another lie, and then it finally gets to where they don't even know what the truth is. You ever watch uh, the White House press conferences? It's kind of like that. <laughs> They're relying the lie. They're making the lie that they told a, a, a different lie. No, we didn't say that. Yes, we live in a world where everything's recorded. Here it is. No, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. Leon Morris points out this. He said the challenge when it comes to was the, the, a gentle challenge that can be imagined. It was, it was not a man but a woman, this, this, this girl. Not a man but a woman, not a free woman but a slave, not a mature woman. It was just a girl that asked him this. This is Peter. He just took, almost tried to take a man's head off with the sword. Peter's got a problem. He stated that he's not one of Jesus' disciples. Yesterday, uh, me and my wife and Christian went to Ronnie's Burgers. Can I get an amen, right? And they know how to do it over there. I don't know how they... You get your money's worth, I'll just tell you that much. There was a little boy outside when I was walking in, and I was hurting real bad yesterday, so I had my cane with me, and I was walking in limping and looking down just to make sure I didn't trip over something. And He goes, I know you! And I said, well, you do, buddy. I said, how do you know me? I said, you look familiar, but I don't know your name. I'm sorry, I, I teach kids and I pastor a church and there's a lot of people and yeah. And he goes, and he told me his name and, and he said, and you're Mr. Ross, you work at City View. And I said, that's right. I said, second or third grade? He said, second grade. And then, and then come to find out, his aunt and I work together. And she's a Christian, she goes to Lamar Baptist, and we have great talks. And, and she and I and the other teachers, we all sit together at lunch and, and chit-chat. You know, and I, I thought that was cool. Here's a little, little boy that, I mean, he can give a rip about most adults out there, but there I am, and, and, and all the kids do that. Why? Because, you know what, I want people to know what I am. I want people to know I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, and I tell them all. I'm a pastor of Liberty Baptist Church. And my boys, they're out in the public and they meet all these people that know me and know our church. And so hopefully at some point that'll get some traction and we'll see people saved in this church grow, amen? And the reason why I said that, I could have, I was on, I was on my weekend. I was exhausted. Man, we had a rough week. We're doing these star blasts things where we're getting these kids ready for star tests and, and I'm exhausted and I could, I could have said easily uh, I'm sorry I don't know I don't know who you are it's not me 
and walked on in. So God's put me there to love these children and to show the light of Jesus Christ to them. And so not only did this little boy identify me, but I got to meet his mom and his dad and his little sister. I don't know. Maybe that's a seed, right? We talked about it Wednesday night. Just like that little, little girl to Peter, I know you. You walk around with this Jesus guy who they're trying to kill right now. And the word also used in verse 17 is a reference to John who is already present and known by the high priest family. And the question expressed here, literally, it's kind of, it's not rhetorical, but kind of in the, in the sense that she expects a positive answer as a little girl. She's expecting Peter to say, yeah, I'm one of Jesus' followers. Little girls would expect that. She knows it. But unbeknownst to her, there's a war raging with Peter's faith, and he says, no, I don't know him. I'm, I'm, no, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not a part of that. You see, Peter at this point didn't want to be identified as one of Christ's followers, and the danger remains still the same. Listen to me right now, church. How often have you found yourselves in a situation when it comes to a matter related to your Christian faith? And that arises in... It's at those times when you face the danger of maybe trying to hide your Christianity so that you can blend in with your surroundings. The problem is, folks, with every opportunity that we have to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ and our faith in Him because of what He did at Calvary, when we fail to do that, that is a denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can it be said, when he or she is with Christians, they act like a Christian? But when he or she are among non-Christians, they act like those folks. I won't name names or anything, but there was a time that somebody come up and someone had done great harm and had gossiped a whole lot and on the phone and caused a lot of damage to me and my family, a lot of hurt more than anything. And she goes, well, you know, at the end of the day, at least we're all Christians. And, and you know, I, I tried to be gracious. And, hey man, hug, you because if we are, then we'll spend all eternity together. But what I wanted to say is evidence to the contrary. If you're a Christian, that means you are following after Christ and emulating Christ. Now listen, we've not all arrived yet. I don't always say the right things and do the right things. And we're not talking about one, one bad minute in your day or your week or your month or your year or your life. We're talking about the pattern of your life. God's not looking at, at one little mistake, although that needs to be confessed and forsaken, amen, church? What God is looking at, you say you're a Christian, and if you've truly been born again, then the fruit of the Spirit is in you, and it's not this one little moment, it's this, your life. From the beginning until the end. And when I say the beginning, I'm not talking about when you were born screaming and with an umbilical cord. I'm talking about when you were born supernaturally of Christ. None of that stuff before that matters. None of it. But the day that you profess Christ as Savior, from that point, you became alive in Christ. And from that point until the time that you meet Jesus face to face, that's what He's concerned with. And while we all may have these little ups and downs, it might look like a stock market chart for some. The reality is, over time, you and me, we ought to be more faithful, more committed, more giving, more loving, more serving, more willing to do whatever it takes for the cause of Christ. And it starts out here as baby Christians, and it goes up a little bit at a time until Jesus comes. That's called sanctification. 
It's called being like Christ. And one day when Jesus comes, we'll be glorified and, and none of that matters anymore. What would people say? You're a Christian? I've talked to people before about, and I was going, yeah, I know, I know, you're, I know that person. He goes to my church and they're like, what? Are you serious? Yeah. Ooh, I can tell you something. I said, I don't want to hear it. But I'll tell you this. There's nobody perfect in any church. And listen, this isn't a, a museum for super saints. This is a hospital for sick saints where they can get fixed up, patched up, serving the Lord Jesus Christ and go on to bigger and better things for Jesus. To Him be the glory and honor. Amen? And so we all have our thing. I need to pick up the pace here. So why did Peter fail the Lord? Let me give you a couple of things because I think it will help you. Number one, Peter's confidence was inflated. You ever seen, well, the final four basketball teams? They have a really big win and they just, they just mop the floor with the team. And because of that, they get a little self-inflated, a little proud. Oh, yeah, we can take on anybody. Only to find that while they might have beat that team before by 40, the very next game, they lose by 20. What happens? Confidence was inflated. Peter says, even if all, if all the others deny you and desert you, Lord, I will not. And it's at this point that Jesus turns to him and says, Peter's confidence was in himself, not in the Lord Jesus. And he says, Peter, let me tell you something, buddy. It's night. We know that the rooster crows every morning twice. And before that happens, you're going to deny me three times. And it must have been a, a big blow to Peter's ego. Because after all, Jesus is God and he knew all things. The Apostle Paul said this about that in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. And listen to me, church, hear this, please. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. You think you've got it figured out? The devil's right around the corner. My wife and I have been doing this so long, over 25 years in full-time ministry. We know when God is blessing, and we are truly blessed, I tell you that, we are truly blessed. But me and my wife both know and agreed it's time, to, it's time to really start praying about some things because we know the devil's coming. And sure enough, he did. He did. And every time, it's like we baptize five and then we have some numbskull that wants to you know, punch a hole in the baptistry or something from the outside the church. And I talked about this last week, and the reason why I bring this up is I want to say this. Everything I said last week was the, was the truth. You hear me this morning? But you can say things in a way that are right and true and maybe the vehicle is not what it needed to be. I got to be honest with you, I was angry last week. When I'm out there doing the Lord's work with the pain and stuff I deal with and I'm serving God and I get a call that there's people that don't even go here, that have never given a dime here, that don't care. Listen, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, the Bible says. Am I right? Am I right? They've never given a penny. And I don't want to rehash all that to say this. I did not mean to be offensive last week. What I said was the truth. But like my mom used to say when I would get in trouble with her, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. And God convicted me about it. I told the church Wednesday night, and I'm telling you now, if I w listen, if the word of God offends you, then, then brother and sister, you're just going to have to wear those shoes. Amen? And I will not apologize for the word of God. I will not apologize for the truth. But if I'm offensive, that's on me, and I've repented of it and confessed it to God, and I don't want to be that way. I want to preach with power. Amen? 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 I want to call the devil a sorry rotten dog and kick him in the teeth if I can. Amen? But people are people. And while we hate the sin, we love the sinner. Amen? Amen. And so God help me and God help you to take heed when we think we stand lest we fall.
And the one who thinks he cannot fall into sin is a fool. If, it can have, if things can happen to some of the great people that I know that things have happened to, it can happen to anybody. Anybody. Well, we've been married for 50 years. I heard the story of somebody that were in their 70s, won the lottery, they hated each other's guts, lived in separate rooms, and want to divide the lottery up, and you go your way and you go your way at 70-something. I mean, who's going to change their depends when the other one's moved out? Right? I mean, Lord, if we, we, get, we get old, we're going to need somebody to care for us. Peter's confidence was inflated. Even if others deny you, I will not desert you, Lord. But notice also his weakness was ignored. Peter's basic problem was that he had, a, he had an inflated opinion of his own strength. Amen? You remember him walking on the water? And I, hey, listen, you know, all, everybody else stayed in the boat, so shame on them. Jesus said, well, come unto me. And he starts walking on the water, and he's like, woo! And you know, knowing Peter, what we know about him, I will almost guarantee you, and in heaven, I've got to ask him, did you look back and go nanny, nanny, boo, boo to the guys in the boat? You know what I'm saying? Because something happened and he got his eyes off of Jesus and onto the storms and he sank. And in the shortest prayer recorded in the Bible, he simply said, God help! <laughs> and Peter was lifted up by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? He... he he, when he lost sight of the Lord, he got to thinking, look at, look at what I'm doing. But he wasn't doing, any, doing anything because we don't walk on water. Only Jesus walks on water. He did not understand the deceitfulness of his own heart. You know, Jeremiah tells us about this, and, and I pray about this, and I'm going to wrap this up, and we'll just have to finish it. But the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and who can know it the reality is we don't even know what's in our heart completely we think we do but in the wrong moment at the wrong time we're capable of doing anything that's what Dr. Oldham used to say he said I don't care who you are preacher, assistant, singer, teacher or just a good Christian church attender in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong mindset you're capable of doing anything We all know what it's like to make promises in church at the altar but then live a lie when it comes to the times that life gets tough and work gets tough and school gets tough. And we mean to follow Christ and in the dark and difficulty of life when, when there's a cost to be paid for the commitment and surrender we say, you know now that you mention it, I, I, really, I really don't know Jesus. I really don't know him. But he, that's what Peter said. I don't know the man that I've lived with for three years. I don't know the man that I've served with for three years. I don't know the man that I've watched cause the, the lame to walk, the blind to see, and the dead to come forth out of their tomb. I don't know the man. I don't know the man that, that come walking on the shores of Galilee one day and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And, and, and I came and, and that's exactly what he's, what he's done for me. And, and he's used me, somebody just average, an average Joe, and he's used me to do great things. And he's given me, like Judas, power over demons and, and the ability to heal as an apostle and all these things. But I don't know him. And, and, and I, I, I've got so much more, but I'm going to stop right here because, listen, it's the same for you and I. And we pray. And, and you know, we, we, we get in the habit, I think, of praying sometimes, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, right? Or help me, help me, help me. I've never really quite understood that, Lord. Help us to and help us to. You just, yeah, we need God's help. But there's some things we don't need to pray about. Lord, help me to study my Bible. I don't, you don't need me to help you with that. It's a command. Do it. 
Lord, help me to pray. <laughs> That's kind of ironic. You don't need me to help you to pray, just pray. Now there's other things, there's, there's other callings, there's other tasks that, that certainly we need God's will, we need God's word, we need God's guidance. But the things that are commanded in the scripture, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Read the Bible, friend, it tells you. Am I right, church? So what do we need? What do we do? We just do it. When we don't feel like it, we do it. When we don't, we don't want to do it, we do it. When we're not sure, we just do what we're supposed to do. Amen? And I'm going to be at church. And I'm going to be at the Bible study. And I'm going to be at the refresh. And I'm going to be at whatever dinner we have on the ground. And I'm going to help wherever I can, doing whatever I can with the facility and with the lawn. Why? Because this isn't Pastor Rick's church. This is God's church. And it's our church because we are called out to be that assembly. And therefore we each have a part to play. Amen? And it's teamwork that makes the dream work. Right? I'll tell you, back in the early days, I had the privilege of being here as a young boy and witnessing this. And it was all hands on deck, brother and sister. Everybody. We had elderly people driving buses. We had, we had elderly people putting tents up. That, they weren't really tents. They were just old parachutes that were trashed out at Shepherd. And we got them and made a tent out of them. We had gospel circuses and gospel roundups. And, and we had uh, uh, western scenes where men shot blanks at each other. And somebody, you know, we had, yeah, we've had everything. I've dressed up with a woman with bubba teeth and thick glasses and a wig on showing my sexy legs before. Why? We were in a campaign to get people here, see people saved. We did what we could do. I mean, for crying out loud, Brother Olmstead back, he walked down the aisle one time wearing a, di a diaper with a pacifier in his mouth. Why? It was funny. It was exciting. It was taking part in, in some, building something bigger and better than all of us. See, individually we're weak, but together we're strong. Amen? And God said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. So while we have Holy Spirit power in us and Jesus resides in us, if we've truly been saved, together in church we have Holy Spirit power. When we come together in one accord, doing one thing, one faith, one family, one focus, and God will bless it. Amen? Peter goes, he's having a difficult time. Peter's having trouble. He's denying the Lord Jesus to the devil's crowd. The next thing we're going to see next week is he's denying the Lord with the devil's crowd. And folks, sin never pays. Don't think, listen, you have a friend that you think you're going to bring them up let me tell you, if they won't come to church with you, they're going to bring you down. I've seen it a hundred thousand times. A true friend that really wants to be better and really loves you, you invite them to church and they will come. So you gotta, you got to be careful, especially you young folks. And it's nice to have a heart and it's nice to be caring and loving of people. But be careful, you won't bring them up, they'll bring you down. And let me tell you, if the devil can use it, he'll destroy you. You don't believe me? Ask Samson who fell asleep in Delilah's barber shop. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. We'll look more at this next week. Because... It's, it, it's not going to end. Peter's story doesn't end badly. Ultimately, it ends up in a really good way. And that's what we need to see, that it doesn't always have to end bad. What the devil means for evil, God can use for good to save much people. Genesis 50, 20, look it up. Joseph's entire life was a series of unfortunate events. And you know why? Because God orchestrated every single bit of it to put him in the exact place he needed to be when a famine came. And because of him, the children of Israel were saved.
They didn't starve to death. And they're a nation today that would have been obliterated off the face of the earth through that famine had it not been for Joseph being in his place, doing what he was supposed to do and being the kind of character and integrity that he was supposed to have no matter the situation. He was falsely accused. He was sold into slavery, thought for dead. He was thrown into prison. Everywhere he went, though, he won people to Jesus. Everywhere he went, he bragged on God. And you know what? There would come a time that the king would remember it and put him in a place that he never thought he could be, all because he was just faithful. And he didn't deny God, even in the hard times, like Job man that feared God and hated evil. The sons of God come to present themselves for him and hast thou tried my servant Job? You can do whatever you want, you just can't kill him. And Job went through all of it. His pe- people accused him, if you're, do- you're dealing with this because of sin, you're going through this because of sin. His wife said, curse God and die. And Job said, even if God slays me, yet will I serve Friend, the sooner you can adopt that kind of policy for your life and your faith, the better off you'll be. It doesn't matter. What are they going to threaten me with? Heaven? Amen? That's all they could have done to Peter. They could have taken his life if he stood up for Jesus at that time. Yes. But like Paul would say later, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If he lives, he serves Christ. If he dies, he goes to be with Christ. Make that commitment, that surrender this morning. Even though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Father, have your will and way in this time of invitation. We love you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I I, I realize we're, we're dredging through some deep swamp waters right here that are perhaps sometimes difficult to hear, difficult to reconcile in our own lives. But it's the, the truth and it's the reality that every single one of us deal with from this pulpit all the way down to the very back seat. God help us never, ever, ever to have our faith so weak and our fear so great that we would deny doing what you've called us to do. That we would deny being what you've called us to be. That we would be to the point so bad that even to a little girl we would say, I uh, know I, I don't know the man. God help us. Save the lost, dear Lord. Change the Christian. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Listen, we don't know, but we know He's coming. And I look around, and times of the signs we're in them, and they're everywhere. These signs, the things that are happening. And I know people go, hey, "We've been hearing this forever. It's different now." It's different now. For 200 plus years, there was a light that seemed to be over America, no matter what the rest of the world felt like, but it's, there's darkness now. And any born-again child of God, a, a true devoted Christian, I believe, can sense it. And we're not to live in fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, Paul said. When we see these things come to bow, Jesus said, you look up. Your redemption draws nigh. Help us to ever be mindful of that. Each and every day is one more day we have here to live for Him. And then the work is done and we go to our eternal reward and we live with Him forever and ever and ever. God, have your will in your way in this invitation. Lord, I love this church and these folks so much. And God, I want to see you bless them. I want to see them live in victory. I want to see their kids raised to walk in truth. We've got to pass. Lord, us older folks, you know, you're calling us home one by one. And what will this place be when this next generation comes and takes over? Or will it be? 
the signs that are showing now is, are not good. God, we need, we need revival, as Brother Hill said. And we need it to begin with us. God, have your will and your way. And to you be the glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. These have come to pray. We're getting ready to sing a song in just a moment. We're going to give you a few moments. If you've not come, come on. Don't wait. Don't linger. Come on. You need a counselor. You need somebody to help you about your salvation, your Christian life. Then you let us know. we got people that will pray with you in complete confidence. We're not going to go spread it in the newsletter of the church. You come if you need to. Spirit of God, stir in our hearts, light up revival. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Rain down heavenly flame here in this place. Unleash your power. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Come now, Spirit of God, stir in our hearts, light up revival. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Rain down heavenly flame here in this place. Unleash your power. Oh, Spirit, come have your way. Let's sing together. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today the faithful you have been the faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my Father, the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. You showed our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, rid of all her shame. Her true name, and it's why I sing your praise. Well, ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. Well, ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. Well, ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. 
hope you heard from the Lord this morning. Say amen. I hope you, uh, I hope you did. Very quickly, regular announcements, of course, on Wednesdays. I just want to remind you of everything going on here with the kids' ministry, uh, Crossroads, God Squad, Student Ministries, and then the Walk in the Word with Pastor in the adult Sunday school class behind me. I uh, was asked to also uh, remind you ladies, it's in the, in the bulletin, but uh, the ladies' Bible study continues tonight at 6 p.m., and uh, please come be a part of that, and if you haven't been a part of it, I promise you, Miss Patricia will not turn you away. Uh, just come see her, and she'll help you out with that. Um, folks, it's coming up very quickly, but uh, we've got a Good Friday service coming up on the 15th, which means that Easter is two days from then. And we need help with uh, Sunday school, Sunday school, Easter eggs um, in the uh, uh, entry out, out here. There's a, there's a box in the Welcome Center. And if uh, you could help us out with that, the sealed plastic eggs with uh, uh, individually wrapped candies. Um, and then, of course, Easter Sunday will be on the 17th. Looking forward to that. Uh, and then uh, Miss Patricia also wanted to uh, highlight um, the Faith Refuge Mill on the 29th, which will coming up here toward the very end of the month. Uh, it starts at 5.30, and there's a sign-up sheet on the back table here. If you got any questions about that, you see Miss Sarah Smith, okay? Is there anything else, Pastor? Brother Hill? All right. Well, God's been good to us today, once again, meeting with us and, and allowing us to hear from uh, His Word. And uh, I pray you go out and have a great week this week as the Lord wills. Brother Billy Shelf, will you dismiss us, please?